Well, good morning and welcome to Amford Evangelical Church. You're either on the phone or you're joining us online. Perhaps there are some folks gathered together in our church building in Amford, even some later on in Llandebia Memorial Hall this morning. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the medium of joining together this morning, I want to say a warm welcome and an especially warm welcome to the men who have joined us this morning, be they fathers, be they uncles, be they older brothers, be they just role models in the lives of so many. Today is Father's Day. I don't know whether Father's Day is an internationally celebrated holiday or not, but it's it's something that we want to take note of and we want to celebrate as a church today. All those men who have an influence, who have an impact, who have an opportunity to bless and enrich the lives of those they come into contact with. You know, sometimes when we think of fathers, the images that come to mind can be quite negative. Maybe our own experiences are of poor fathers, or we have witnessed fathers who, rather than bringing joy and life and blessing into the lives of those entrusted to their care, have brought pain and suffering and hurt. And so when we come to the scriptures and we read of God as a father, that's how Jesus taught us to pray, wasn't it? To our father in heaven. When we read of God as a father, we can be confused. We can even be slightly negative about that image of God. You know, sometimes I think we can come and we can read that description of God the father and and think of him perhaps as someone who plays favourites, someone who has kindness and generosity to be shown, but only to his special children, only to those who are very close to him. You know, one of the the wonderful things about the good news that Jesus proclaimed, the good news which we hope to proclaim as a church, is that that relationship with God is available to everyone. That God isn't a God who wants to keep himself and his blessings just to a small and select group, but his desire is for all people to know him and to experience life with him and to enjoy the abundance that comes from being connected to him. It got me thinking this week about Isaiah chapter 2. When Isaiah looked forward from his perspective as a member of God's chosen people, his, his special nation, his children, Israel, he looked forward to a time when God would be known and celebrated amongst all the nations. This is what it says. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple, that place where God's presence is known and experienced, where God's worship goes up. That place will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above all the hills and all nations will stream towards it. Many peoples will be coming and will be saying, let us go up to that mountain, to that place of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. We want to be taught his ways. We want to walk in his paths. We want his law to come to us and go out with us. His word to be ours. It's a picture of God, not just for a select few, but for the many. It shows us God's fatherly heart. God who, being himself rich and full of abundance, wanting to share and spread and bless as far and wide as possible. We come today with our views of what it fathers could be. Let's not confuse ourselves with who God is. He is a good a gracious, a kind, a rich God who desires to be known, to know and to love and to bless. I'm going to pray and then perhaps you join with us in song. Lord God, we thank you this morning for all the positive examples of father figures in our lives. Be they literal fathers, be they men who have invested in us, Perhaps even only people we've heard stories of, but have lived in such a way as to become an example for us. Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for their blessing. Lord, we pray for those who need comfort this morning as they consider Father's Day. And it's a painful day because they've lost good fathers or because they've been forced to live with poor fathers. Lord, I pray that in the midst of all of that, we would all see you, God, as our true father, our good and great Father, who has loved us and loved us well and desires to love others just as well. Lord, be with us in our service this morning to take our eyes off whatever it is that's consuming us and fix them on you. 
Fix us on the one who is lifted up high and above them all, the one who does come and give and love so well. Help us to see you and to enjoy you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. A word creates a breath, destroys the greatest enemy. You never tire or sleep, your hands are strong to keep. Oh Lord, is anything too hard for you? Your strength is strong.
After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anybody on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal those who are ill and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and you are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. Good morning. It's good to have a purpose in life, isn't it? That's what we're going to talk about today, the purpose that God has for us. I mean, it, any kind of purpose is, is good, isn't it? When you have a new project that you want to get your hands uh, dirty with, or a new idea, or a new job, or a new relationship, you put all the kind of different things together, make your plans, and you're full of anticipation and excitement about getting stuck in, about putting your shoulder to a purpose that's going to leave a mark, that's going to make a difference, that's going to leave a legacy. It's a good thing. It's, it's actually what we need as humans to have a purpose. Well, Luke, in the story that we read today in Luke chapter 10, we hear Jesus give us a purpose, not just for the 72 that he sends out for their purpose, but a purpose for all of us to be a part of. Uh, it's a thrilling purpose as well. It's something that you can put your shoulder to, that you can put your whole life behind, and it'll be something that leaves a legacy that echoes into eternity. Jesus gives us an amazing purpose. If you're a Christian today, this is a purpose that you're a part of. So I've got seven P's to kind of explain it and unpack it today. Seven things that begin with P. So you could get a piece of paper, write down seven P's, and see if you can fill them in as we go along. So the first big thing, what's their purpose, their job, is to prepare the way for the king. Do you see that? That's right in verse one. Jesus takes 72, pairs them up and says, go and make a way for the king. You see, Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He's on a mission. Go, to go to Jerusalem to die and rise again to save the world. And these people are supposed to prepare the way for people to meet that king, to meet Jesus. The king of Israel is coming to the people of Israel, so they need to be prepared. That's their job, but it's also our job, not necessarily to go to the people of Israel, but we as people of the world to go and take this message to the world, that the king of the world is Jesus. That's our purpose. You see, we're part of the 72 as well, but in a kind of different way, because 72 is a significant number in the Bible. First time you come across it is in Genesis chapter 10, and it's the number of nations that there are in the world at that time. 70 nations plus Israel, Edom, makes 72, which means that this, I reckon, Jesus picking 72 is a kind of nudge, a bit of a nod, to that symbolic number of the whole world. So this is not just a job for these people back in the day, but it's a job for us too, as people of the world, of all the nations of the world, to take the good news that there's a king 
Jesus, a king who's come into the world, and to take that good news to the people of the world. You see, that's our job, to prepare the way for the king. And we're not supposed to do it alone. The first P, prepare, we're supposed to do it in pairs. That's our second thing. We're supposed to do it as a team, the team of the church. These guys get sent out in pairs. They might be women too, who knows exactly who they are. But these people get sent out in pairs, and we're put together in a family of, uh, of people called the church. We have a team of people, of men and women and um, children, of all sorts of different people from all kinds of backgrounds who are sent into the world to prepare the way for the king of the world. You see, we're not supposed to be lone rangers as Christians. We're supposed to be sharing good news with others. And that's good for us, isn't it? It gives us accountability. It helps us have encouragement. You know, two minds at least are better than one, so you can answer tough questions. There's somebody else to help you when you don't know the answer. We're supposed to not be alone in this job. We're supposed to go together. That's why God gives us the church. But it's not just that we go together with other people. Actually, we go with God to this task. This is our third P, is, is our big priority, which is prayer. Did you see that? Before Jesus actually sends them out, and you can imagine them there, kind of buckled up, ready to go, shoes tightened up, champing at the bit, ready to go out to their task. And Jesus doesn't say, go just yet. He says... Verse 2, the harvest is plentiful. That is, there are loads of people who are spiritually ready to hear this news. The harvest is, is ready for the picking, but the workers are few. There's not many of you. 72 sounds like a lot, but actually it's not much when you think of Israel. So what do we need to do? We need to ask the Lord of the harvest, pray to God, and ask him to send out more workers into the harvest field. So that's our job as Christians. The first big priority of our lives it's not just to crack on and get going, but it's to sit down or kneel down and pray. So how could you do that this week? Well, you could maybe set your alarm for 10 minutes earlier each day and, you know, still hit the snooze button two or three times, whatever's your usual pattern, but just get up 10 minutes earlier. You could do that. I could do that, I think. And pray. I pray that God would send people out into the world because there really is a huge harvest and not many people to go. In Amherstford, if you do the maths, in our kind of SA18 postcode, it's about 29,000 people. For us as a church, we're about, I don't know, 100, 120 altogether, different people connected to the church. So there's about 200 people in our area for each one of us. That's a lot of people. A lot of them are ready to hear about Jesus, but there's not many of us to go around. So we need to pray that God would, would bring more Christians into our area, would help us to go and be good, diligent workers in his harvest field. And when you think about the world, the stats are even more crazy. About 40% of the world live in countries or in tribes or in areas where there are just not enough Christians for them to hear in their lifetimes about Jesus. You could walk through your whole life in some of these places in the world and never stumble upon a Christian to tell you about Jesus, not once in your life. 40% of the world lives in places like that. So we need to pray that God would send out people. And I wonder if as we pray, God might do that thing he often does when we're praying about needs, where he puts his finger on our hearts and says, you be the answer to that prayer. You are the answer to that prayer that we are. If you're a Christian, you're one of the 72 of God's people called from God's world to take the good news of God's King, Jesus, to his world. The King of the world, preparing the people of the world to meet him. That's our job, and we don't go alone. We go with each other, and we go with God. So let's set our alarms 10 minutes earlier and pray that he'd go with us and bring more people to go with us too. But it's a dangerous thing doing it, isn't it? That's our fourth P, which is a D in English. I know about that, I'm sorry about that, but it's actually a P in Welsh. So danger is perigal, perig in Welsh. And that's what Jesus says next, isn't it? Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. It's a dangerous thing to tell people about Jesus. In our culture, it's dangerous for your reputation. Maybe it's dangerous for your career prospects or dangerous for your relationships. In many countries in the world, in a lot of countries in the world, it's dangerous for your life too. But Jesus says, I won't go, as I won't send you anywhere that I'm not willing to go. Jesus sends us out, but never sends us to do anything that he's not willing to do himself. Jesus went out as a lamb among wolves. He was praying one night and a, a gang of men with torches and swords and clubs gathered around him like a pack of wolves and rested him. 
and took him away. And another pack of wolves in a court threw accusations at him, screamed at him and sentenced him to death and handed him over to another pack of wolves, the soldiers who tore his body to pieces, put a crown of thorns on his head and then took him outside to another baying crowd of wolves and crucified him. Why did he let himself go through that? Why did he plan to go through that? Why does he set his face to go like the lamb to the slaughter of the wolves? He does it so that so that we would be forgiven. He dies for us. Jesus went to his death so that he would swallow up death, so that all of evil and darkness could be sunk into the grave. See, Jesus lets the wolves tear him apart so that three days later he'd rise again and tear evil and death and sin apart. Jesus doesn't go, doesn't call us to go anywhere that he's not willing to go himself. He's been through death and out the other side, so we'll be safe. We'll know that he's with us, that he's alive today, that he survived the wolves. And so when he calls us to go to dangerous places, to lose our reputations and to, to suffer for him, we know that we're not alone. We know that he's the one who sends us like he sent these people. It's him who sends us into his harvest field. He's in control of it. There's nobody else who's in control. He's the one, it's his harvest field. He's the Lord of the harvest. And we go with his message out to his world in his strength, with his promises, and he promises to be with us. There's a beautiful story about a man, a preacher from China in the 1940s who was called Wang Mingdao. He was put in prison. He was one of the most kind of powerful, gifted preachers of his generation. But he was put in prison for 30 plus years, released in the 1980s. And somebody interviewed him and asked him, said, you're now half blind and too weak to preach. Do you feel bitter that God allowed you to spend 30 years in prison? And Wang Mingdao replied, no, for me, my time in prison was, listen to this, my time in prison was a honeymoon with Jesus. I feel no bitterness. How could he feel that? Well, because Jesus was with him. Even in solitary confinement for years at a time, Jesus was walking with him through that suffering. Jesus walks with you through your suffering, through anything that you risk. Jesus will be with you and will provide for you. So there's no staying safe in God's kingdom. We've kind of got used to that mantra, haven't we, over the last few months? Stay safe, stay safe, stay safe. And we should, when it comes to kind of the virus, we should, I think, take our vaccines. That's a way to love your neighbour. It's a sensible and good thing to do. And we should wear a seatbelt when you drive. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I mean, when it comes to our lives with Jesus and risking our reputations, risking our lives to share the good news with those around us, to tell them that the King is coming, that they need to be ready to meet him. When it comes to that kind of thing, we shouldn't be staying safe. We should be risking everything, risking everything to reach our neighbours and those around us. And maybe, is this you? Risking everything to pack up your life here and move to the other side of the world, to move to North Korea, where it's pretty certain that you won't come home. Are you ready to risk everything for Jesus? Because he has risked and given everything for you. He calls us to follow in his footsteps, to pick up our cross and follow him. Well, one other thing we can be sure about, I think this is P number five, is God's provision. His provision, so when we're in difficult times, like with Wang Mingdao, he provides for us with his presence. He walks with us, but he gives us everything we need as well. It's quite a striking thing, isn't it, in this passage? Jesus tells them they're about to go into danger and then says, so don't take anything with you. No stuff to keep you safe, no home comforts. Just go out with the clothes on your back and I'll provide for you. That's not a command for everybody. We know that because in Luke 22, you can look it up later on, Jesus tells his disciples, to go out again, to, to go to the world, and this time to take stuff with them. See, he's teaching them a specific lesson in this passage at this point. He's teaching them to trust in him, to not take anything with him, and instead to just trust themselves into his provision. I wonder if you trust him, if it's Jesus that is really keeping you safe day by day, or if it's your bank balance. What is it that makes you feel safe? When is it in the month that you f feel most at peace? Is it the day after payday? Is it when you've got all of your investments sorted out and you've paid off your mortgage? When all the bills, is that when you kind of can breathe a sigh of relief and know that you're safe? Or is it, is it that Jesus gives you your daily bread and he's the one who keeps you safe? Well, if, you're, if you think you're in that position, you're kind of feeling comfortable, maybe living for the stuff that makes you feel safe that isn't Jesus, 
it's a pretty dangerous place to be. And so maybe the challenge for you this week is not just to get up earlier by 10 minutes, but to, to look at the stuff that you have around you and ask yourself, what could I give away that would leave me in a really difficult position? That would leave me in a pretty precarious position to the point where I'd need to really trust God to provide for me? How could you be radically generous this week it's to the point where you really need to be praying hard for God's daily bread, day by day. That's the lesson Jesus wants us to learn, to trust in him. See, there's another thing going on here, though, is that when they go out without anything, with no food or, or kind of spare clothes, they're relying on the hospitality of the people that they're going to. And that means that those people that they're going to have a choice to make. When they come and uh, when these people come to their town and tell them about Jesus, tell them about his peace and his power, those are our next two Ps after this. Tell them about, about Jesus and his peace and his power that this king is coming. Then, then they have to make a choice to welcome them in or to leave them out in the town square. They can't just go and book in a hotel for the night. They have to stay there in the town and the people either welcome them in or send them packing. And so you see, these people, we are God's ambassadors. We're meant to give people a choice, to electrify the fence so that they don't sit on the fence about Jesus anymore. That they make a choice whether they follow him or not. Now, how we do that is, is tricky in our day. We don't do it in quite the same way. You know, we don't travel, most of us, from town to town. We live in our houses and we stay here for many years. So it's going to look a bit different to us and we'll get to that in a second. But you see, those first five P's show us that we're Jesus' ambassadors. Sorry that that doesn't begin with P, but you'll have to live with that. We're his ambassadors, representing him to the world around us. And that's an amazing privilege, isn't it? That we go, we're called by him, we're equipped by him, we go in his name, we go with his words, we go with our hand in his hand. It's an amazing privilege to be Jesus' ambassador. So don't take it personally. If somebody rejects you and turns you away and doesn't really want to know much about Jesus, don't take it personally. You're an ambassador for him. It's not really you they're rejecting. It's him. He'll provide for you. He'll walk closely to you. He'll be with you. So you can trust in him. Be bold. Don't stay safe. Go out and share Jesus with people. But what do we say? How do we do that when we go? Well, these are our last two Ps together. We're supposed to preach or proclaim, tell people about the king of peace, who's the king of power. That's what their message is all about, isn't it? In verse five and onwards, when you go to a place, bring peace, say peace to this house. And then heal people in verse nine. Heal those who are ill, give yourselves to them in service, find out what they need practically and serve them with all your heart, with all of God's strength. Give them peace, give them a taste of it. Serve them practically and also tell them about the king of peace whose power brings peace. That's what the, the message, the kingdom of God, remember that? The kingdom of God has come near to you, that's what they're supposed to say. A king is coming, a king of power who will bring peace. Do you want to know him? Do you want to welcome him into your life? That's their message. And that's our message too. The message of the fact that there is one king over all the world and all of us have to come to him and get to know him. And that that's not bad news. That's really good news because he's a king of peace. He's the king who's been willing to die for us. That's amazing news. It's huge news that there is a God in heaven and that he loves us and that he wants to bring us home with him. It's really good news if you accept it, but it's really bad news if you don't. You see, it's the same message, isn't it? The people who don't accept it, who don't welcome his messengers, they shake off the dust and they say, all right, this is a warning to you that the kingdom of God is near, has come near, that a king is coming, who's a king of peace, who's a king of power, and if you stand against him, then what you're going to get is not peace. What you're going to get is his power used against you. Do you really want that? You see, it's a warning as they shake the dust off their feet and walk away. It's a warning against those towns. And Jesus is, it's as if he's filled up, kind of overflows with emotion at this point in verse 13. And he starts to weep and to lament and to pour himself out in really deep, heartfelt, emotion for these cities that have rejected him. This isn't Jesus saying kind of judgment over people with a little twinkle in his eye and a smirk on his face saying, you know, glad you got your comeuppance, finally. It's not like that at all. Jesus is weeping for these cities. He's broken hearted for these places, Chorazin and Bethsaida, Capernaum, that thought they were so great that they didn't need the King of Peace. And Jesus warns them and says, on that last day, 
a day that's coming where everybody will stand before God. On that last day, you people who've heard about Jesus but rejected him, you'll have it worse off than these other places that have a reputation for being pretty dodgy places like Tyre and Sidon and Sodom. You can read about Sodom's story in Genesis 16, uh, 19 or Ezekiel 16. What was their problem? The problem was they were so distracted with their own stuff, with their own desires, with their own lives, that they didn't welcome God's messengers. They didn't welcome the news about a king of peace who'd come. They didn't want anything to do with it. And so they walked away and God brought not peace on them. They chose darkness and God gave them darkness. They chose death and God gave them that. They chose not God and they got not God. They chose to walk away from him and that's a really sad place to be. But it's what Jesus says. Jesus says there's a day coming where every single one of us will stand before him and we'll be judged on whether we've welcomed him or rejected him. Not so much judged on whether we've kept the Ten Commandments or whether we've done this or not done that or got our lives in order, but no. All those things are symptoms of whether you've welcomed Jesus and bowed the knee to him, whether you've turned away from life as you know it and followed him, yes, said yes to his purpose, or whether you've not, whether you've gone your own way and decided to make up life as you like it to be with him outside of the picture. If you choose to walk away, to shut your gates, to close the door to the king of peace, the king of power, then the fact that he exists, the fact that the kingdom has come near, is really bad news for you. Because it's true. There's a king of peace who's given his life. And if you don't want his life, then, then there is no life apart from him. There's a king of power who's given himself to be the king of the world, a good king. And if you don't want him, then I'm afraid you set yourself against him. And that's a really dangerous place to be. See, Jesus says right at the end in verse 16, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So that's the question for us at the end of today, is are you gonna welcome his purpose for you? Are you gonna say, yes, I wanna follow him. He's gonna be mine. I wanna walk his ways and tell everybody about him. If that's you, then good. If it's not, then you please reconsider your position. Please come and get stuck into reading about Jesus and finding out about him because it's a dangerous place to reject him. But if you're, if you want Jesus, if you've welcomed him, then how do we share this with the people around us? You know, when we're not going from town to town like these guys were, but we're staying in one place, well, I've got three quick things for us to finish off and take away and think about and kind of work on this week. Apart from um, getting up a bit earlier, apart from taking a look at our lives and working out how we can rely more on God, here's three practical things with kind of to, to do with sharing the good news with people around us. One is listen, just go and ask people questions. Ask them, so were you brought up in a religion? Do you have a faith? And then zip your lips and just listen. Maybe have a drink in your hand and every time they stop talking, just take a good long drink for a nice pause and keep listening to what they say. Let people open up and talk to you. And then eventually share a little bit about Jesus with them. That's first thing is to listen and let people talk. And then think of an interesting, intriguing, kind of strange story about Jesus that might turn their understanding of him upside down. I don't know, Jesus turning water into wine, giving really good wine to people who are probably already kind of at least half drunk. Why would he do that? Well, he does it as a picture of his kingdom, that when it comes to Jesus, life is not going to be worse. In the long run, life is not going to be worse if you come to him. Life with Jesus is goodness and abundance. It's life without Jesus. It's life without Jesus that's sad and dark. So you could tell somebody a little story about Jesus. Listen to them and listen, listen, listen. Two, tell a little story that might speak into their lives that would bring them to see Jesus. And then number three, just mix with non-Christians. Bring your friends who don't know Jesus and your friends who do together. Have a barbecue, have some dinner. Get together and talk so that we're meeting worlds together. So that we, God's people, are going out to the people who don't know him yet and sharing our lives with them, finding out ways that we can serve and give ourselves to them, and then seeing if we might have opportunities to tell little stories about Jesus and teach them about the King of power who brings peace to everyone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is who you are. That you are the King who's honest with us and the King who brings peace to us, who uses your power to serve and to love and to pour out your life to give us life. Lord, we pray that you would 
that you would help us not to turn away from you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to embrace you, to walk with you, to want this purpose for our purpose, to follow the footsteps of these 72, to go into all the world and trusting in your power, Lord, going hand in hand with you, trusting in your goodness, facing every fear. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have courage, to walk with you, to embrace you and to teach others of the King of peace. Amen. God, our Father, praise is waiting for you and to give it is our great privilege. Your praise is due from all your offspring. All your handiwork displays your splendour. The seas in the dry land, cold winters through warm summer, morning light until evening shade, they are full of you and declare your majesty. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You lift up and you bring down. All you do is wonderful. All your works reveal glory. Let us be more like you. Let us resemble your perfect son. Let us walk in your word. Let us love as you teach. O oh God, our Father, rescue us from the darkness we desire, the corruption we spread, and the temptations we face. 
life though wonderful, is dangerous for your children. Keep us safe every hour. Deliver us from evil. Like the rising of the sun, we anticipate that day when Christ will be honoured in all the earth, when all will see and declare his fame as brothers and sisters, we will enjoy him. We wait for that day, hoping, longing, craving its fullness through the first fruit of your Holy Spirit in us. Thank you, Father, for all your good gifts, for all your kindness and mercy yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Well, our service is all but over for this morning. And let me just say once more, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for joining with us. And if you've been able to take part, to leave a message on the Facebook or the YouTube or what have you, thank you so much for being a part of it. If you're here and you've been with us perhaps for the first time or you're still new in that sense, you've been with us once or twice before, we'd love to hear from you. Please don't step away from your computer or your tablet or your phone or whatever it is this morning without heading over to amforchurch.com forward slash contact, um, leaving us a little message. Perhaps you've got a question for us. Perhaps you just want to be able to put your hand up and say, hi, this is me and I've dropped by this morning. We would love to hear from you and to have that opportunity maybe to go for a walk and to grab a coffee in the glorious weather we're having at the moment. amforchurch.com forward slash contact. Well, we've heard this morning about the good news that we've been given to share. Um, we've heard this morning about the potential that some will accept it and, and some will reject it. We've heard about the urgency of that good news, but I, I want us to finish by just remembering it is good news. That God in love sent his son to come to be with us, to live with us, to live for us, to die in our place, but more importantly than that, to rise to life again. Jesus, knowing that the time had come, was drawing near for him to be raised up, set out resolutely for Jerusalem. It's good news for those who hear it, see it and understand it. It's God's love on display for all of us. I want to let you know about one thing that's happening in the life of the church coming up. Next Sunday evening, we've got our monthly Welsh language service. We call it Darganvod, and it's going to be once again over on Zoom. Now, that means that if you're not a Welsh speaker, this really isn't the notes for you. But if you are a Welsh speaker or like me, you're a Welsh listener, um, then you are warmly invited to that. Uh, the details are over on the Darganvod Facebook page or the Darganvod uh, YouTube page as well. There's a link that you'll need. If you've had the link previously, then you can use that same link or you can email us at contact at amfordchurch.com to get that link for yourself. We're pleased this month to welcome John Trehan from Llangenech. Uh, he's going to be coming, he's going to be preaching and there will be lots of other things happening in the service. So that's next Sunday evening. Darganvod Mehevin is happening. Okay, let me just pray quickly for us and then um, we can go and enjoy uh, the rest of our Sundays. Lord God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the brief time we've been able to spend together in your word, listening to your voice. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't just be something we will have done and move on from, but it will be like a seed planted in soil, which is taking root and growing up, Lord. Whatever is needed for that growth to happen, we pray that you would bless us with that now, that you would grant that to us now, Lord, the, the rain that we need, the sun that we need, the warmth that we need, the time that we need for that seed to take root and to grow up and to bear fruit, Lord, let it be done. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to share Jesus more and more with the people around us. Lord, be with us in your spirit to make that a reality and to have Jesus' name lifted up. 
Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful week.